good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing today? You ready for the Super Bowl later today? All right, good. I'm kind of still struggling with the fact that uh, my beloved Packers lost to the Seahawks. I mean, they had the game in hand. They dominated the whole first half, and then series of bad decisions and bad plays and things just kind of unraveled. I think they were playing not to lose instead of playing to win. And uh, apparently they couldn't handle it when things were going well for them. And then, as it often happens, things just began to unla unravel for them. And it reminds me a little bit about what happened to the Israelites in the story. Things had been going really, really well for them under the reign of King David and under his son, King Solomon. Things were going so well. Then a few bad decisions, a, a few bad kings, and before you know it, things began to unravel and the kingdom divides and you've got Israel in the north and you've got Judah in the south and out of 38 kings, 35 of them were bad and they just keep going down this path and before long, God brings judgment on the people of Israel. And 721, Assyria comes and defeats the northern kingdom of Israel. And, and they're dispersed as the ten lost tribes of Israel, never to be coming together again as a nation. And then later on, 586, uh, Nebuchadnezzar comes and, and they carry off the, the chosen people of God into to exile, into to Babylon now. I don't want you to think that I think that Pac the Packers are God's team, but you do have to admit that those bad decisions led to them unraveling kind of fits. It might be a stretch, but the point is, is that when things begin to unravel for us, it can lead to some severe consequences that we don't want. Our recent study in the story has been about how God's people have rejected God time and time again, and they've turned to worshiping idols instead of worshiping the one true God. We have that same issue today, don't we? Not that we, we wish, worship statues that are made by human hands, but that we end up putting something else on the throne of our heart instead of the rightful place that God should have on the throne of our heart. It might even be a good thing that we put there. It, it could be our family, or our friends, our work, a uh, hobby. But anything that takes the place of God on the throne of our hearts becomes an idol, and it becomes idolatry for us. And that can be very dangerous. So God sends his prophets to the people of the Old Testament, and they speak to us today as well. He, he sends the prophets over and over and over again to, to warn his people to repent and to turn back to God once again, because God knows what's going to happen if they stray away from him. Lately, as you gathered, our, our story is about the people in exile, they're in, in Babylon, 900 miles away from home. And they, they want to get back home. They're being forced to live in a foreign country, someplace where they don't want to be, and they just long to get home once again. It's hard when you're not at home and you want to be home. God wants them to understand where home is. See, home is with him. Home is in Jerusalem, at the temple. And the people of Israel are longing to, to journey back to Jerusalem, 900 miles away from home, and they're a long ways from home. But they're yearning. They're yearning to return home once again. We're in Ezra chapter 1 today. After decades of being in exile and isolation away from God, we, we read in Ezra chapter 1, verse 2. This is what Cyrus, the king of Persia, says. 
The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Now, remember that this is a pagan king, a foreign king, and yet God is going to use him to accomplish his purposes. Apparently, he realized that the kings of Israel and Judah, if they won't do it, then he'll find someone that, that will do it. And so he turns to a Persian king to accomplish his purposes. Continuing on in verses 3 and 4, Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and rebuild the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and, and may their God be with them. And any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold and with goods and with livestock, with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. You talk about an amazing turn of events, kind of like when the Seahawks came back and beat the Packers. This is a much bigger turn of events. God turns the heart of the Persian king Cyrus toward the Jews, toward his people. And just like King Nebuchadnezzar last week, and just as we'll see next week in the story of Esther with King Xerxes, their heart is turned toward the people of God. And God uses them to accomplish his purposes. The interesting thing is, is that God's going to do whatever God wants to do because, after all, he is God and we are not. And so we read this week about King Cyrus. He's told by God to let the Jews go back to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the temple of God. It says, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. Isn't that interesting how God can move people's hearts? I think that's an amazing thing when you stop and think about it, that, that God reaches down and he moves the hearts of people. God influences Cyrus to give the people their freedom. He gives them the resources they need in order to rebuild the temple. He sends them home. Home is where the temple is. Home is where God is. And the temple represents God to the people. You can't truly be home unless you're home with God. Yesterday I participated in a funeral, good friends of ours, uh, Elaine Dickey, who passed away. And, you know, there, there was a, it was really a, a celebration of her life because now she has been released from her body, which had become a prison, and she's free and she's home at last. She's home with God. One of the first things her husband told me when I visited with him this week, he said, um, she can see now. See, she had glaucoma and she could only see peripherally and she couldn't see, but now she can see Jesus face to face. Why? Because she's home. This world is not our home. We're passing through. Heaven is our real home. And for the people of Israel here, home is where the temple is because that represented God. And so God's presence wasn't there yet. They had to go back and rebuild the temple because without the temple, where would the priests go to co communicate to God on behalf of the people? Without the temple, where would God's people gather in order to worship him? Without the temple, there was no place for them to go to, to give their sacrifices in worship to God. And so for the Jews, the temple was extremely important. The temple was the visible reminder that God wants to be among his people. He wants to be close to his people. The temple communicates the fundamental truth that God wants to be right there in the midst of his people. The temple's not on some isolated mountain, no. The temple is smack dab there in the middle of the most populated city in ancient Israel, right there in Jerusalem, the city of God. So every time anyone would walk past the temple, there was a message that was being communicated to them, just, just like the tabernacle was before they built the temple, that God wants to be in the midst of his people. He wants to live in our neighborhoods with us. 
God wants to be right there in the middle with us, in relationship with us. And so God tells him to go back and, and build the temple that had been destroyed. And it's going to be right there in the middle of town. And, and they built everything else around it because the temple was the center of their life. It reminds me of my hometown down in Marshalltown, Iowa. Marshalltown is the county seat for Marshall County. And so in the, in the center of town, they built the courthouse. You know, the, the courthouse was off, often in the center of town. And, and they built everything else around it, like a, the old-fashioned town square. And that's what the temple was. The temple was at the heart of the city, and everything else revolved around it because temple life was at the center for the people of Israel. And in 538 B.C., 50,000 Jews are set free, and they're funded by this Persian king Cyrus. And they make this 900-mile journey from Babylon back to Jerusalem, the city of God, in order to rebuild the temple of God. And so they go to work on the temple. At first, they're zealous. They roll up their sleeves. They go to work. Their highest priority was getting that temple rebuilt. Why? Because home is where the temple is. Home is where God is. And the temple represented God to the people. Ezra 3, 1 says, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. In other words, they're united. I, I love that word, united. They were united together in a task to accomplish what God had given them to do. And, you know, when we're united as a body of Christ, we can accomplish so much more for him than we can when we're divided. And people are united here. They're focused on rebuilding the temple because they want to go home. The temple is where God is, and that represents home. Verses 2 and 3 of Ezra chapter 3 go on to say, They began to build the altar of God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it in accordance with what was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the peoples that were around them, they built the altar on its foundation and they sacrificed burnt offerings on, the, on it to the Lord, both morning and, and evening sacrifices. Now there's something exciting about a building project, isn't there? I mean, it's work, it's always more expensive than what you thought it was going to be, but, but there's, it's exciting. I've been involved in a few building projects, and it's never easy. There are always those who try to discourage you. There's always the naysayers. There's those who want you to stop. But the people of Israel, they stay on task. They, they make God's priority to rebuild the temple. They make it their priority. They were excited to be home, and now they're excited to be working on the temple because the temple represented God's presence with his people. But you know what happened after a while, don't you? They kind of lost interest. They lost some motivation. They lost their focus. They began to give less and less attention to the house of God and, and more and more attention to their own personal needs and their own personal projects. I don't know exactly what happened. I don't understand what happened exactly, but maybe they got tired physically of putting stone and mortar together. Maybe it got to be too much for them. I don't know. Perhaps it was the taunts and the jeers of, of those who were ridiculing them for their rebuilding of the temple. They had their enemies who were trying to discourage them. They were threatening them. God never said it was going to be easy. He just said that it was important that they go back to Jerusalem, that they rebuild the temple, because the temple represented God's presence with his people. So they start thinking about themselves first. They think less and less about God, and they get distracted. They lose their focus. Has that ever happened to you? I know it's happened to me before. How many of you have already blown off your New Year's resolutions? You start out on the right track. You have good intentions. You, you want to make some positive changes in your life. But over time, you begin to slip back into some of your old habits. And, and you slip back into some of your old patterns. And you begin to make all kinds of excuses. And 
you kind of give in to those distractions because you lose your focus. That's exactly what happened to the people of Israel here. They, they lost their focus. C.S. Lewis once said, if you put first things first, you get the second things thrown in. But if you put second things first, you lose both first and second things. And, you know, I, I think he's right. My guess is that these well-intentioned Jewish believers did not intend to abandon their building project forever. They, they were probably thinking, well, we'll get back to working on the temple someday. Just give us a week, give us a year, we'll get the harvest in and we'll get our houses done and let us get our stuff done and then we'll pick it up and we'll work on the temple again real soon. There were no more sacrifices though without the temple. God's temple became unimportant to the people. God's home became a lower priority to them than their own homes and to their own needs. A week passed, a month passed, a year passed, two years, five years, and before you know it, it's 16 years later. The temple project is sitting there untouched. It turns into an abandoned construction site because second place things became first place for the people of Israel. The weeds grow over and soon they cover over the foundation, not to mention the foundation of their faith. Sixteen years was enough time for a whole generation of children to grow up and to see their abandoned project of rebuilding the temple. They thought, to, well, I guess our parents don't really care much about God. They, they certainly don't care much about his temple. I mean, they're just letting it sit there. They didn't mean to do it just kind of happened. It's not just an Old Testament problem, is it? Do you see some parallels in our own lives? In the New Testament, Jesus speaks to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. He says, Yet I hold this against you. You've forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. Do you remember that time when you first crossed over the line of faith and you said yes to Jesus? That you were surrendering yourself to his lordship, that he, you were making him the Lord and Savior of your life. Do you remember the excitement, the passion that you had when you, you made that commitment to him for the very first time? And then over time, you get distracted. You lose focus. Other things come into play and they, they come between you and God. Jesus says, repent. You've forsaken your first love. Remember in God's upper story, God is working out his plan and we, we're living it out in the lower story. God never gives up on us. God never gives up on wanting to be in relationship with us. And he's willing to do whatever it takes. He's willing to pursue us. He's been described as the hound of heaven who is just going to not give up because he so desires to be in relationship with us. And so God in the Old Testament, he raises up another prophet. This prophet's name is Haggai. Haggai comes to call the people to repentance once again. Haggai speaks to the people about the problem that they have. In 16 years, the temple is still in ruins. Listen to what he says. Haggai chapter 1, verse 4 and following. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house of mine remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. Isn't that a great line? Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them into a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. 
Listen to this. Go up into the mountains and you bring down timber and you build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and I may be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be so little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. What an indictment against the people. God is pointing out what should have already been obvious. He's disappointed. Once again, his people have failed to follow his clear instructions. When the blessing of God is removed from our lives, our lives are not going to work out very well, are they? For 16 years, they'd been building the wrong house. For 16 years, they'd been given the wrong impression to their children. Oh, yes, we love God. We just don't have time for him. Oh, we want to go to the temple. We want the temple there. We just have these other things that are more important to us right now. There's always something missing in your life when you quit on a project or when you bail on a relationship. But listen to how much fun it was for them at the very beginning. Ezra 3, verse 11. All the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this new temple being laid. And many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the sound, shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the, Lord, the people made so much noise. They were excited when they started. But somewhere along the line, they lost their steam. They lost their focus. They got distracted. And it happens to all of us. So God sends his prophet telling them to repent, to return, and to turn back to him. <clears throat> Every day they walk by that uncompleted temple of God. It had to feel to them like there's just something that's not right here. They changed their address from Babylon to Jerusalem, but they didn't change their situation. They came home, but they weren't really home yet because home is where the temple is. Home is where God is. And the temple represented God's presence to his people. I want to be clear this morning that the church building is not the temple like it was in the Old Testament. In fact, the book of Acts, when Stephen, the first martyr, was being stoned to death, he was being stoned to death for his preaching because the, the religious leaders didn't like his message. He said, you killed the Messiah of God. But God has raised him from the dead. They didn't want to hear the message, so they stoned him to death. But what he said before he died is very instructive. Acts 7, verse 48, Stephen says, the Most High God does not live in houses made by men. See, God doesn't want a temple. He wants to be among his people. He wants to dwell among us. He wants to be close to us. Not about the temple building. It's more about what the temple building represented. It's about the temple life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19, Do you not know that your body, the temple, the Holy Spirit. God dwells in us now through the gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God designed it so then we assemble it together as a church body. We can get our spiritual batteries recharged. Because when we're out there in the world, the world beats us up and it beats us down and it's dark. We come to a place of light where we can have our batteries recharged so that we can burn a little more brightly and we can reflect the light of Jesus to our world around us. And so we assemble each Lord's Day to, in, for inspiration, for accountability, for fellowship, for communion, for teaching, for the opportunity to worship, for biblical instruction. It's important that we gather together to hold one another accountable and encourage one another, build one another up. Because life 
in a fallen world is tough. That's what the first church did. That's why we do it today the way we do. The body is at its best. When we are united, our members are working together in harmony, and we need each other. We need everyone because this world is not easy, and it's easy for us to become distracted. The famous preacher Dwight L. Moody was asked by a church member why he was always praying for the Lord to fill him up. I always hear you praying, Lord, fill me up. Why do you always say that? Why do you always pray, Lord, fill me up? Dwight L. Moody said, it's because I leak. And, you know, we all leak. That's why we need to practice God's presence on a regular basis so that we can be filled up again, so that we can give of ourselves as we go out to our family and to our workplace, to our neighbors and to our friends. Temple life is more than just showing up. Temple life is about sacrifice. It's about acting like Jesus. And Jesus is to be at the center of our lives just as the temple was at the center of life for those in Israel. Temple life is about being grateful to God for the sacrifice of his son Jesus on the cross. And when you come to grips with the fact that he died for you, you are then willing to sacrifice for him and give your life in service to him to develop a kingdom mindset so that you can share that good news of the gospel with those who have not yet heard it. One of the most important things that happened at the temple was the sacrifices that were made. That is why the rebuilding of the temple here is so important. When they offered a lamb for sacrifice, it didn't really forgive their sins. It just put them off for another year. So they laid their sins on the substitutionary sacrificial lamb. Once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. And he'd sacrifice the lamb, and the sins of the people were put on the lamb. and would never take them away completely until Jesus came. Jesus laid down his life as the perfect sacrifice once and for all. Now we're forgiven through the blood of Jesus because of his sacrifice on the cross. Listen to these verses. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 1 Peter 2, verse 5, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Luke 9, 23, Then he said to all of them, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What all these verses are saying is that we need to offer something to God. And it's you. We have to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God because of what he did for us on the cross. And thanks to Jesus, today we have access to God. It wasn't always that way used to be that only the high priest could go into God's presence in the Holy of Holies. There was, there was a curtain that separated the people from God in the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the high priest would go in there to make the sacrifice. But an interesting thing happened when Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, the Gospels tell us that the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom representing that it was God who did it and that now the way had been made open for us to have access to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain that is his body, since we have this great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with full assurance that faith brings us. Jesus has made the way. 
He's paved the way for us to have direct access to God. We don't have to go through a priest any longer. We can go to God directly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We'll learn more about that faith in the coming weeks as as we wrap up our Old Testament story and as we begin looking at the coming of Jesus who will fulfill God's plan and his purposes and his promises in the New Testament. The Old Testament has been important for us to to see the story of, of God and how he's working through his people, but it's only a foreshadowing. It's only preparing us for the coming of Jesus into our world. And God keeps sending his prophets, and and the prophets keep telling the people to repent, turn back to God. So I want you to hear the prophet's message today. We all need to turn our lives around. We need to repent. We need to turn back to God. We, We need to remember that first love of when we first said yes to Jesus. See, God loves us. He's going to go to anything he can, any length he needs to go to, to bring us back home to him. Because home is where God is. He wants to be with us, to be in relationship with us, to dwell in our midst through his Holy Spirit and through the church body. Let's pray. God, we thank you that... uh, you would never let us go, that you desire to be in relationship with us, and and you've gone, gone to great lengths in order to make that happen in sending your own son Jesus to die, to open the way back to you for the forgiveness that we can have through his shed blood on the cross. And so, Father, help us to rediscover that first love once again, to live our lives to your glory with passion that you have given to us. Pray your blessing on us now in Jesus' name. Amen.